Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful, warm autumn day. I apologize for forcing you to be here instead of spending valuable time outside. I can assure you I'm here myself only because I didn't win the Powerball. <laughs> so keep playing. I've created a new page where I included a few picture, pictures, frames from the film Traffic with some essential notes because the first thing I want to do today is go back to the <coughs> scenes that we watched last week and do a little bit of cinema critique and analysis. Look at the framing and the composition of the frames, the mise-en-scene, explaining the connection between the visual style of the film and the themes, the idea in it. Once I'm done with that, I will briefly introduce the next series of scenes. We're going to watch two or three segments, depending on the time that we have, including the conclusion. And I will leave the boring stuff, the conversation about the final exam and the notes I placed under week 11 about the final exam at the end of this class. If by any chance there is enough time to answer questions, etc., we can resume simply on Tuesday, okay? So I'm going to leave this page, and again, you find in here some an outline of what I'm going to say. And I've prepared, I, I have about 1,500 frames, screenshots from the whole movie, representative of every camera angle. And I've selected about a dozen groups. Maybe I won't explain everything. We'll, we'll see how quickly uh, we can go through them, and so I will uh, uh, talk about individual scenes or groups, sequences that are similar, that are connected thematically or visually. We've already said about the significance of the uh, first part of the movie, the title, the uh, credits, with the uh, frames shot in a factory, in a Renault factory in, in France, in reference to the theme of the movie, because one of the themes of the movie is the dehumanization of modern human life thanks to technology. So showing at the beginning of this movie an assembly line where workers <laughs> are forced to repeat the same gestures over and over again, and they're shown as connected to the technology in a subservient, in a subordinate role, becomes emblematic of modern life in general, right? And from this point on, you almost never see humans far away from cars, without any clear indication of the added value that this particular technology and technologies in general have for human life, for society in general, right? In terms of framing, you see three or four camera angles, this one from above and uh, a, a couple more that are similar, emphasizing the machinery over the human element. And that too is a stylistic quality feature of the whole movie. In a lot of frames, you notice a preponderance of technology. The automobiles occupy more of the frame than humans. Keep in mind that the frame is four by three because the movie was initially produced as a TV movie. It was not 
uh, intended to be released in theaters, although it did go to the theaters uh, by the end. And I mentioned how uh, shooting in this format was less expensive in terms of equipment as well as film. The film itself is expensive. In spite of that, in his usual fashion by the end of the film, Jacques Tati had run out of money and in order to finish the movie, he had to borrow the equipment and the staff from a crew that was shooting a documentary about the film. A lot of films have um, semi-professional uh, people shooting a documentary uh, for, for limited circulation. And so he uh, engaged them uh, in, in the conclusion of the film, okay? Of course, you have a choreographed repetition of gestures. It is everything follows a rhythm and the sound also in numerous scenes of the movie emphasize this kind of repetition. So you see, of course, the frame is defined by the structure of the machine in the assembly line itself, right? You see where it starts and where it ends. And you see the same kind of framing repeated. This is the machine. One of the things that gives it a rhythm is the fact that the machine is printing car parts, right? It's bending the metal to produce the car parts. So you see the machine closing and opening numerous times. And a minor pattern that you may have noticed already, and you'll see it again today, is about people cleaning. There is always someone cleaning something, polishing something. And it's typical of the general theme of lack of deep meaning. Because cleaning is, is of course, a meaningful, a relevant activity for all of us. But it doesn't have any deep meaning, especially when cleaning is applied to products whose existence don't really add anything to our own lives. Okay, so you see people cleaning offices, cleaning the cars themselves, etc., which is humanity spinning the wheel, basically, involved in activities that don't inspire any deeper learning of, of meaning or the acquisition of sense to be applied to life. This is another angle for the same scene. And here we are back looking at the machine and the structure of the machine defines the boundaries of the shot. Now we are from the top. And again, one piece of car after the other. So the condition of humanity is a condition of servility. Humans are servile, are subservient to this kind of technological life. They're never at the center. They're never the heroes. It's not humans who are moving or going nowhere or anywhere. It's just the cars. In this case, you see welding, and I've just captured this frame, but you see the welder moving the machine up to different points, repeating again over and over the same gesture. And you see different shots. Of course, this was created, was, was shot in a real factory. Another kind of shot that you see inside the factory is this, crowding the frame with industrial element, using an angle that multiplies the opportunity for pieces of machinery to enter the frame, right? To show the 
domination, the preponderance, the prevailing presence of technology in our lives. But the machines have occupied our lives and taken sense or meaning out of it, right? So there is also the experience of meaningless, of, of, of the experience of a senseless life, of a life where you're not recognized, you're not acknowledged. This is another example of a shot that is connected to the theme of the film. Pieces of cars, in this case tires, are moving. So you see them moving, and there is a lot of movement when it comes to these secondary elements in the film, but when it comes to the actual mobility of humans, humans trying to move from point A to point B, then technology is a hindrance. Doesn't really perform any utilitarian function or service. And in fact, throughout the movie, the only people who are moving effectively are people who are trying to walk. And their walking is, is slowed down by the presence of cars. Okay, so it's a parody, it's an ironic interpretation or critique of modern mobility whereby cars are the problem, make you less mobile. And best case scenario there, mobile cages. Your, your life is caged by the vehicle and we'll see later people inside, a lot of people inside their vehicles they're not doing anything, they're not going anywhere really because they're always stuck in traffic and the traffic is moving very slowly. But that's how life has been structured after meaning and sense have been taken, subtracted from it, right? Again, a shot that allows you to see how many different elements of industrial assembly lines are present together, right? to give you this sense that technology is everywhere, humans are barely to be seen, and when they are, they're smaller compared to the elements around them, surrounding them, as, for example, in this case. There is someone at the door checking cars out. It's quite probable that this was added by um, Jacques Tati, not, not shot in real life, and that this is an actor, but once again, is to show that humans are serving cars, and after you see them coming out, being checked out with the repetition of the same ritualized gestures, put the ticket, wait for the next car, put the ticket, then he moves to the parking lot and little by little you realize, you see how the shot is widening from the top, and you realize that our world, the modern technological world, is occupied by cars. And humans always dwarf in comparison to the general view. So many cars and so few humans. Charlie? Is this a real photo or did they use like a Yes, so th this, this must be the parking lot of an actual uh, Renault uh, factory. Yeah. So these are cars waiting to be shipped. Right. And you see this guy almost lost in this ocean of, of cars. So what is this for, really? And the next scene takes place at the auto show in Amsterdam, which is the alleged destination of the characters in the film, even though they'll never get there. From the very beginning of this section of the film, you see the theme of lack of meaning involved in the work done by humans, because you have people mounting the letters 
for the big sign of the auto show, but specifically what these two are doing, the man at the foot of the scaffold and the one on the scaffold itself is adjusting the O, which shouldn't be adjusted, right? However you put it, it should be fine. It's an O, it's not a U or other letters with an orientation. Yet, they're working precisely on this, meaning whatever you do doesn't have any real sense or relevance. And then they're satisfied, they find the position, they're satisfied, and we see the larger shot. Then we go inside. The scene inside were done inside a hangar at an airport in uh, Holland, uh, I think, must have been the airport of Amsterdam. And the staff is placing uh, wires that are barely visible to mark the spaces for the cars. Again, the theme, the visual theme of this segment is that humans disappear and space is instead allocated to the technology, even though that technology doesn't really enhance the lives of humans. And we'll see later from the shot that is almost paradoxical because you always see cars outside. Society, urban landscapes are full of cars. And then you go to a place where you find cars even inside, and they're pretty much the same cars, right? Which is what happens, for example, at the auto show in New York at the Javits Center, which is not like Detroit or Geneva, one of these auto shows where they present concept cars. And no, it, it's like a bunch of dealerships bringing their cars, right? Ordinary cars, and, and everyone is going there, myself included. But you see a closer shot to give you an idea that the space is being subdivided, that you have these wires. And then little by little, you grasp the size of the place, and this frame will remain through a, a long series of shots. And because of the way the frame is defined by the ceiling and the sides of the building, the humans working inside become much smaller, and then the concentration is on the dance, on the ballet of them skipping the wires and moving around like chickens, basically, without really getting a sense of any work being done. Yes, we know they're planning the auto show, but what we see is not immediately related to anything that has sense. And it becomes especially funny because these are dressed elegantly like managers and yet they're playing this game with their leg, right? And going and talking to each other like uh, insects or ants. And you see how the frames create this pattern of movement, but once again, is a movement that is not associated to any visible sense. And this was the last one for this. Next, we saw Hulot, Monsieur Hulot, Jacques Tati himself, enter the scene. And right away, you see that Hulot is the visual intruder, is the element that is out of place. He's wearing a raincoat, even though it's not raining. He has an umbrella, which is part of his character. The character of Monsieur Hulot appears in... Uh, I think all of his movies, um, and it, it always carrying an umbrella the way that Charlie Chaplin is carrying a stick in several of, a walking stick in several of his movies. Notice also the mise-en-scene. Now this time, the first time the camera frames Monsieur Hulot in the background, you, saw, you see how the background is not as industrialized as technological. Yes, there are a few cars parked, but notice that, that we have plants on one side, we have older buildings in the background, and the cars themselves are kind of old. And then we'll see him walk. So he's not really 
fully participating in the ritual of fake pretend mobility, right? He's trying to walk uh, the way uh, people do uh, to add to the elements of uh, the non-ordinary nature of the characters. You have the pants not reaching the shoes, the yellow striped socks, the pipe, the hat. And next we see him walk and trying to compete to occupy space with the cars, and through the next frames, we'll see him walk across the street. Whereas cars are not really as usual. Yes, they're moving, but they're moving very slowly. So you don't get the idea that cars give you any enhanced mobility compared to walking. And there are other people walking, although they're in the minority in the background as well, but there are just, uh, about a dozen people in the shot and a lot of more, a lot more cars or pieces of cars. And you see the same cars are there. They haven't moved much by the end of this segment. Another secondary topic of the film is modern ways, modern means of communication. The same way that mobility is not increased but hindered by um, the automotive technologies of today, communication, which happens through various devices, PA systems, telephones, is not enhanced, does not really benefit from the use of these technologies. In fact, very little is being communicated and oftentimes communication is being obfuscated, right? There is a lack of communication. In this case, you have Maria, who is a PR person. And keep in mind that by the 1960s, PR and, and early 70s, as in this case for, for the movies, 1971, PR work jobs were kind of new during that period and representative of a wave of new jobs that became hard to define, right? So you have the PR person, someone is simply trying to call the auto show uh, about the arrival of the car there and their timeline, but Maria has to intervene because communication cannot be direct, cannot be natural. You need to have the PR person, then there is the obstacle of language because actually Maria uh, doesn't speak much French. And notice on the, at the top, because everything is intentional in movies by Tati, and especially this one, you have two women managing the PA system of the shop where the RV vehicle is being assembled and prepared for the auto show. Because PA communications are part of modern life. Wherever you go in a public place, you hear or half hear PA communications that you cannot interpret as meaningful messages. And even the people involved directly in the work struggle to get any content out of them, right? Once again, the frame is defined by the architectural element as it happened in the factory, right? You see the intentional placement angle of the um, of the camera with an element of chaos. The, the, again, the crowding of the frame with so many elements. Instead of having a close-up of the telephone in this corner, you have the structure of the shop, you have the booth with the staff manning the PA system, you have uh, th these offices, this area, and, and a hint of the space beyond that, right? So there's there is either chaos or there is order, but even when there is order formally in, in the appearance of things, that order is disconnected from any great sense or meaning. So Maria takes the phone, but then she 
uh, can really interface with the people at the auto show. And again, she's not communicating directly to the people at the auto show. She has to go through the uh, staff at the desk at the entrance of the auto show. Notice in the background, people cleaning, right? People involved in these menial activities that uh, are kind of demeaning for the general humanity, okay? And there is a running gag of these two ladies talking to each other about things, about the people who come by, they're gossiping. So they're perfectly able to communicate with each other, right, when it comes to, to gossip. But when it comes to professional communications, then there is always some hiccup, right? They're not really effective at uh, furthering the communication. So the PA system relates the message to the empty space that is being organized for the auto show. And this gives you a sense of emptiness, solitude, and lack of meaning, again. She is waiting, then she's not able to understand, and then she has to go in and call Monsieur Hulot, who speaks French. Once they leave the shop with the ultra truck that is carrying the RV vehicle that is supposed to be delivered in Amsterdam, what you see is visual patterns of order with no visible meanings. It's mostly lines and colors with a prevalence of diagonal lines. Notice how the frame has been um, placed so that you have the railing perfectly uh, um, uh, framed by the corner and going in that direction. You have the other diagonal line of the highway. And of course, once again, it's mostly cars. Yes, we see a few houses, but no human presence there. Humans exist in this frame only insofar they're encased inside cars. And their life is limited by the cars, not enhanced by them. And to add to the paradoxical nature of mobility, you have another car carrying a tree trunk to the auto show, and that is the only part of their display, the fake tree, the, the, the tree trunk and the fake trees for, for the fake forest with the bird sounds that will actually manage to get to the auto show. So they will present the opposite of mobility, a forest with bird sounds, right? A forest where allegedly you can get lost as the manager will, will try to do. Notice how she's dressed for the experience of driving, right? Like someone from a hundred years ago, she has this leather cap because she, she's driving an open top uh, car, which is a retro car an Italian retro car called Siata, a rare uh, car. It's to be unusual and quirky because the character of Maria is also quirky. And Maria, in terms of mobility, you see Maria always zipping away on this car, going in a thousand places, but never really accomplishing anything, right? Like Monsieur Hulot, she is irrelevant to the result of their mission pretty much. And once again, they're on the road and you see plenty of cars. And again, you see diagonal lines, you see how the camera has been placed so that this van comes out diagonally in this direction and you have the road in uh, going, creating other diagonal lines. Same here, right? Plenty of diagonal lines going up, going down, and the colors of the car. There are humans, plenty of them. What are they doing? They're fixing the road. So the entire existence of a large chunk of society revolves around mobility. But what is the general purpose of mobility? It doesn't have 
any visible reason for occupying so much space in our life. Again, the frame is trying to capture different levels of highway with diagonal lines. Notice how the bus disappears perfectly into the corner, right? And these things are, uh, of course, intentional choices by the director. And you see frame after frame is just the choreography of lines and colors of mobility. Here too, right? You have these three lines defined by different levels of highway. And the cars are mostly spots of colors, the suburbs in the background, just buildings, no visible human presence. Here too, you see the different levels and the diagonals, diagonal lines. And you have a hitchhiker trying to go to Amsterdam and he will not get a ride from them. The tree, however, is being transported there, right? So his tree would have a semblance of meaning. Why should a tree trunk go to Amsterdam? is less clear, but the tree trunk will get there because goods always get to a destination. Humans, not as much. And again, you see the preponderance of diagonal lines, right? Going there. Here too. And then you have the first breakdown. And once Messier Hulot gets off the car of the manager and decides to join the track, you know that things are not going to go right. You know that Hulot is an element of chaos. You know that it's not completely aligned with this kind of life where you need to repeat intentionally and carefully gestures that will produce a result whose meaning has been decided by someone above you, and even if you don't understand why you're doing something, you're supposed to do it. Hulo is trying to put his own will into uh, his own intentions, his own planning into the system, and the result is the opposite of order, the opposite of the accomplishment. Again, diagonal lines, this time starting from here and going in that direction. One of the visible themes of this film is the non-places of human existence. Non-place is a modern concept introduced by a French scholar by the name of Marc Auger. I've um, placed a link uh, to the Wikipedia article about non-places, which is sufficient even if you just read the first two paragraphs to get an idea of what a non-place is. A non-place is a place where you go through or spend a little time in your life, but they're not places for gathering. They're not places for social exchanges or interactions. They're not places where your identity is recognized or acknowledged. So it could be a train station, it could be a mall in certain urban settings, not necessarily by the definition of the mall itself. It could be the road. It could be the rest stops, the places along the road where you stop to get food, to get gas, places where you might not go back ever again or only after years. And because of the nature of the places, you have the absence of meaning, the absence of meaningful interactions, right? So uh, Maria will go get help for them but we'll first stop at this place. And again, you see that this place is defined by uh, the needs for commercial traffic, right? You have plenty of tracks and other vehicles. So the existence of this restaurant in this place is justified by the fact that there are people going through and stopping there to have a drink or to get food. But these places make you anonymous make you 
lose your identity. So there are plenty of people that you can encounter there, but they exist only in so far they are each an appendix to their own vehicle that brought them there. And you can see that in the same fashion as Monsieur Hulot, Maria is kind of the chaotic element, the element that is out of place, the fact that I've chosen this uh, uh, yellow bird uh, uh, color for the car, the strange, antiquated, ob obsolete uh, design of the car itself brings attention to her, together with the fact that, of course, she's beautiful. The actress herself was a top model. And clearly, the eyes of the man are always following her, and she gets a lot of attention from men. But again, there is no meaningful or deeper interaction that takes place in here. Everything is transient. So, see, people getting in and out of trucks, getting in and out of the restaurant, and Maria herself goes there. Notice the subtle messages, for example, in here you have a label saying, au volant, la vue, c'est la vie. The view is the life at the steering wheel, okay? Meaning you, you have to keep your eye uh, focused on the road, but it's also, symbolic of human existence, you're always the steering wheel, that is your life. And you have people, as is it, it is in the nature of these places, especially in Europe, you used to find plenty of these places. In the US, you would have found more of these places during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and then by the 1970s, they were disappearing, right? And even now, there are long stretches of Highway, take the Long Island Expressway, for example, there is only one rest stop uh, through the entire highway. And of course, she has to use the telephone to communicate what? That they're late, but that communication will be difficult. But that's the extent of her interaction, using the phone, and then, of course, when you use the phone, you have to go through the uh, secretary on staff at the auto show. And again, they're having a conversation about the manager's wife and the people around. But when it comes to helping with the uh, communications, nothing much happens. And again, the overbearing presence of the PA system sending out messages and the chaotic visual appearance of the auto show still being organized and the lack of sense is infused even secondary shots for example the Honda uh, corner they're trying to uh, make sense of the boxes and see what's up what's down having to deal with Asian ideograms and the director the manager of the other show comes by and he says, you man, figure it out. So no one is able to really find any sense. And in terms of sense, what happens when you have emptiness? When your life is empty, void, deprived of sense, then random casual patterns emerge. As in this case, where you have people bringing vases and some kind of manager coming in, and it becomes a ritualized procession, as if the man were a pharaoh, right? Where you have the man with the plants unintentionally accompanying and crowning this man with this elegant attire, with the plants that are moving uh, in the same way that you would expect from an ancient parade of royalty, etc. And the manager goes to a phone, but again, communication is always problematic and limited in the amount of content that is actually moved from one point to another. And you have here the kind of 
random casual interactions that can take place in a place like such as this, which are, are not really human in nature, right? Because they are so limited and so superficial. And then you take your car, you only exist, you only go through these places, you only exist in these places for a few minutes and then everyone is back into the road, meaning everyone is back into the solitude of their car. Let me select um, one more and then we can see, let me see. So in this case, after the truck has been fixed in the same garage where they're watching on TV the, man, the uh, uh, liftoff of the Apollo 11 taking the first humans to the moon in a, a garage in a godforsaken place where nothing is being done. You don't see car, cars being fixed. You just see broken cars inside and outside. They finally leave. But again, living it doesn't mean that they're moving, they're going. They're just going back into the flow of traffic that moves very slowly, as slow as someone walking or even more slowly. And then you see a parade of characters inside their cars doing nothing, really. They're not going anywhere, they're not doing anything. And you see one after the other, caged, framed by their car, and you see the intention of framing similar angles, the various humans, but this is what society has been broken into. And even the small elements of, of, of sense, in this case, the significance of the colors of the traffic light are completely ignored. Red means stop, but even green means stop because the human will not move. The old guy will remain there trying to get the cigarette out and everyone else will react and they will come out, but they can't move because they're chained to their cars, right? So the cars prevent their mobility, essentially. Okay, let me... Go to the film itself. So, one of the places that are in known place is the police station where they, the truck and the characters are taken by the police, by the border patrol, when they fail to stop at the border of the Netherlands from Belgium, they already entered Belgium, and now, when they entered the Netherlands and, and a policeman waved them to make them stop, they, Maria waved back and went through. So, again, it's a place where nothing that makes sense is really being done. The car is being inspected. Paradoxically, since everything is incongruous, the meaning is not incongruent with, in perfect correspondence with the context, this is where the car will be presented. Not at the auto show, but in a garage of the uh, Dutch police or the customs uh, officers of Holland. This is where the car will be presented and where also you have a various humanity that comes there and you don't know why they're there, what they're doing, what will happen to them. So we'll, we'll see most of this.